Hey Jim, so very much for joining me for this episode of The Door of Zoe is oh, Open. Glad to be here. And this episode, it's a tips episode, meaning I'm asking several instructor friends of mine to just give us one great tip. And it can be in one minute, but nobody actually did it in one minute. I'm going to try to do it as fast as I can. It's probably I'm going to take 20 minutes and make it into about one or two minutes here. Oh, that's cool. So okay. what's your tip for our viewers? One of the things I get asked all the time is, I'm at this place in my career in photography and I want to go to the next step. How do I get to this client? How do I go and move to the next step? And I, they always want to do about, how do I deal with promotion? This is what I'm telling people. One of the things you want to do promotion is not just send out a promo card, but it has to be a series of promo cards. Step one, you go to, this, you go to your best uh, paper store and you find the greatest envelope that just speaks to you, a vellum, something very artsy, nothing corporate, something that's very artsy. Once you have that envelope, you know what size your promo card should be because you got to start with the envelope so you know how big to print it. Then you're going to pick your five best pictures. You're going to print up five of the five best pictures. So you're going to have 25 pictures and you're going to put these five pictures in the envelope. So now you have 25 pictures, five each in 25 envelopes. What you're going to do now is you're going to go use your, use your best research, either Googling or on LinkedIn, and you're going to start finding art directors or galleries or people that you want to work for in your area. You don't contact them that way, but you're finding out who they work for and their websites. Then once we do that, the first letter is going to go out with a little, that first promo card will go out with a little letter, who you are, I'd love to be able to work with you, see my website and your name, and it goes out on that Monday. Then the following Monday, a second one's going to go out. No letter, just the print, but it's a beautiful print in the same style with your logo. It goes out on the second Monday. The third Monday, it's going out again. The fourth Monday, it's going out again. So you're picking five people and you're going to hit them five times, five weeks in a row until these people are just absolutely waiting for that promo card. By the third or fourth week, by the third or fourth week, they are waiting to see what you're going to send them next. Instead of sending one pro one card out and they may see it, throw it out, and not see it again, you're going to hit these people over and over and over again. Instead of trying to reach two, three hundred people at once, pick five that you really want to work for and that work really would com communicate well with and hit those five people multiple times. And I guarantee you at the end of those five weeks, one or two of those people are going to call you and say, I like what I see what I'm doing. Can I, I want to see more of your work. Uh, I've looked at your website. Can we have an interview or I've got a job to see? And it's just a great way of saying, I want to go from being just this missed average photographer to being a photographer that works for a higher end agency or I want to, I'm a photographer and I want to get into a gallery. These are the things that multiple hits over and over again. The one time promo card won't seem to work, but when you do it four or five times in a row, they start to see what the whole balance of your work looks like and you will get some real results. That's very cool. Thank you so very much for this. I so Jim. love to be here, and you're such a great, great photographer, and I'm, you know you have such a great following. I just love to be part of your program there. Thank you so wow, much man. for having me. This was quick. Hey, Ellen, um, we're at Photoshop World, and we're in the corridors <laughs> at the Mendeley. It's a beautiful convention, right? Oh, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, right. it's that one time in a year, or two times in a year, actually, where you get so pumped up that you want to go out and shoot. There's an amazing amount of photography here, and I go home inspired. Yeah, me too. You know, you hang out with the photographers, you get to see things that you don't see on a regular basis, and it's just wonderful. So, so for our video web podcast, I ask the photographers here, my fellow instructors and friends, of course, to give a one-minute tip. And it can be a little bit longer, and I know you're one of the, I think, best concert photographers out there. I read your book, and after that I started doing a little bit more concert photography, and it helped me a lot. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a great book, so everybody check it out. I will give the link on the below in the screen now. <laughs> it's right down here. Somewhere. Yeah, it's right down here somewhere. I think there or there. I, I think it's very important um, for photographers, any kind of photography that you do, to really be able to shoot in manual mode. I think a lot of photographers rely on their camera gear now more than they actually rely on their own brain. And they look at a scene, and I know you're a big light meter guy, and you check the lighting, but... You have to be able to set your camera and you have to understand what it's actually doing. And when it comes to concert photography, because the light is changing all the time, I need to be in control of my camera. I don't want to give my camera control of the scene anymore. And I know a lot of photographers, uh, especially when they're starting out, it's so easy to get a good exposure using aperture priority or shutter yeah. speed priority or even that you know program mode. But turn that little dial to M, manual, and go out and start photographing and realize that you can adjust the aperture and the shutter speed yourself. And you can sit there and go, all right, what happens when I start dialing it in and dialing it back? And it gives you a better sense of what the camera does when you go back to the other modes. Now, you don't have to shoot everything on manual mode. You don't have to be like me. Not many people are that crazy. 
but all you have to do is understand exactly what's happening in the camera. So when it actually happens later on, you're like, oh, I know what, I know what it's doing. And if I want to change it, I know how to change it. And a lot of people never, ever get to that point because the cameras are so good now doing it for you. Know your so. gear and start playing with it. Well, the other side of I mean, if you want to get into the other side of it, it, you need to know your gear so well that if you hold it up to your face, you know where all the buttons are without having to look at them. And I work in very dark areas, so when I look down at the camera, it doesn't help because you can't see anything anyway. So the other side of that is if you hold your camera up, you better know exactly which button is where and what's going on. But... Um, when you're shooting in manual mode, it's important to be able to, your brain needs to meter for you at this point. You can, you can look at the light and go, wow, okay, so the camera says I should be at f5.6, you know, 1 250 of a second, and I'm ISO 200. It's great. That's perfect. What happens when I decide to adjust the shutter speed up? How do I adjust the shutter speed up? Do I have to drop the aperture down? All those things need to be in your head so when the camera does it for you later in the other modes, you understand exactly what's going on to get that exposure correct again. Cool. So experiment a lot and of experiment course learn your gear. Hey, with digital cameras, there's no cost. No, there's that's no true. cost in experimenting. With digital Polaroids <laughs> on the back, it's it's, a, it's amazing. You can download them, you can look at them. All the data is there. You can figure out exactly what it was shot at. When I had to shoot film, we used to take out a little notepad. You <laughs> like click. Right, what was that shot at? And then yeah, there's the next, no extra values in the, film. Right, and so you know nowadays we can go out there and you don't have to pay you know ten rolls of film. You have one memory card. Just go out and shoot. Sit in the backyard. Sit in the living room. Just. Get, get used to that idea of your camera and exactly what it's doing every single time. We're here with Frank, and we want to hear what he has to say about... Well, go ahead. <laughs> okay. okay. Now, you know, some people will say, oh, I love this photographer, or this is one of my heroes, and most of the times they're this just... This is going to be embarrassing. Yeah, this tell. is going to be embarrassing, Jay. And most of the time they will just say it because they like the persons that are sitting next to them. However, this time I'm going to take a little bit more of an introduction. I met Jay, I think, four Photoshop Worlds ago. And so, somehow you had the day with Jay Mycel online, and yeah. I'm not a street photographer. And I looked at those images, and I was, I'm more into fashion. And I saw those images, and I say, you know, a lot of the stuff you say makes so much sense for me. And I started doing street photography, and I started out being really crappy at it. And then looking more at your stuff, it was like, okay, now maybe try something like this, maybe try something like that. And the funny thing was, I fell in love with street photography. However... The nice thing is that I'm now looking different also at my fashion photography because you have a totally different way. It's 100% it's different because normally I can coach my models and I have to actually sometimes steal or sometimes get that connection. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say street photography, that's about the most difficult thing to get into. And I love to have you here. What's your tip for some people who will say, you know, I love to do street photography. How do they start? What do they do? Go out and shoot. I mean, you're never going to get any idea of what you can do beforehand because you don't know what you're going to face. And that is the excitement of street photography is that it's completely unchoreographed. You, you have no idea what's going to happen. You, you, you will get a shot that you never expected, and then you'll see something you desperately want and you won't be able to get it. And if you can't deal with failure, street photography is not the place to go. Because you're gonna you're gonna be batting. Well, this is going nationwide, countrywide, worldwide. What? It's a worldwide. Audience. Okay, so I won't make baseball analogies. You oh, know. you can. I think a lot of people. Will All understand. right, the best baseball players hit 300. That means that they don't mm -hmm. get on base seven times out of ten. Well, 
street shooting is a lot like that. A lot of times you're just not going to get the photograph. You'll see it, but it's too late once you see it. You have to anticipate or you have to be ready. Like I have one shot that's an amazing moment. It's pure luck on my part because I happen to be focused on this group of people and then a particular thing happened. So it's very much a kaleidoscopic experience. And if you're very linear and you want to be in complete analytical control of everything, forget it. It's not going to work for you. If you're willing to accept the accidents that make life very, very exciting and interesting, and you're willing to go out with the idea that I'm not going to force what's happening, I'm going to try and let the thing come to me, then you're going to do a lot better. What I loved about one of your classes, and I don't know if it's in one of the Kelby training videos, it's uh, when I went out at first for street photography, I went out like hunting. I went all over the streets, walking, and then I think you said it, find the scene and the players will come to you. No, so The quote is from Robert of Doineau, a French photographer. He said, I find the stage and the players will come. Yeah. In Vienna, I just positioned myself near a train station mm -hmm. and all the people coming out. And it was like fishing in a bowl. It, it, it was like what? Fishing in a bowl, in exactly. a fish bowl. You could I, I just pick a, them out. I call it a shooting gallery. Yeah. Because the things are coming past you and you just, they're, you know, like, as long as you're reasonably good technically and you have a fairly good idea of where you want things in a frame or where you're willing to accept things in a frame. I, I put it this way, like, I have a workshop in New York, and I say it's the only workshop in the country that, number one, you don't have to take two planes to get there because everything goes to New York in one shot. And number two, there's a lot of people. If you screw up, there are 500 more that are going to pass in the next two minutes. Yeah, I love Whereas New York. if you go to certain places, like if you're going to shoot in Jackson, Wyoming, or you're going to shoot, shoot in Dubuque, Iowa, there's a very limited number of people you can photograph. Or Emmeloort in the Netherlands. Yeah, or, or Dubai, where I went and I wanted to do street shooting. And, like, Dubai's like Vegas on steroids in that nobody goes out in the street unless they get into their limousine or their taxi and go out of their taxi to the next venue, you know? It is just, nobody walks around the street. It's like 110 degrees. Why would you walk around the street? But New York is like, it doesn't matter, day, night, 4 a.m., there's people. There's people walking around, there's photographs there. And, and the other thing about street shooting is you have to enjoy the whole thing, whether you get the shot or not. You have to understand that you're learning about people, you're learning about human nature, you're learning, learning about interaction, you're learning about anticipating, you're learning about failure, too, failure. And what's your opinion? Because my opinion is, if it tells the story, the shot is there. But I know a lot of people are like, oh, the focus isn't on the, on the eye, the closest to. With my fashion photography, I'm more like, okay, the focus has to be spot on on the closest eye. With my street photography, I found out that, and again, I'm just a beginner hobbyist mm -hmm. street photographer. If the story is there, I don't actually care if it's a little bit unsharp or there is noise. It, it tells the story and right. that's more mm -hmm. powerful than a sharp image. Do you know who Gary Winogrand was? No. Oh, well, you better find out. Because Gary was like a very great street photographer, an amazing street photographer. And he said something to the effect that relates to what you're talking about. He said, I'm trying to take pictures where the content crowds out the form. Okay. Very courageous kind of thing. And Gary was a very courageous guy and a very courageous photographer. And... Uh, he was explaining that he didn't care if it was a little out of focus. He didn't care if it was not straight. He cared what it said, yeah, the, story. the content. Because it's always, with every artist over the history of time, it's always been a form and content, form and content. And if you can get the both of them to work, that's wonderful. But if you get the form to work and there's no content, it's an empty picture. You know? Well... Thank you so very much, Jay. It was an honor having you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, Lindsay, thank you for joining me at our webisode of The Doorhof is Always Open. And what's in the name, right? I like it.
Now, you're at Kelby Training, and you also have a class on Kelby Training, I believe Fashion with Flair, or Fashion Flair. Mm -hmm. I love that class, by the way. So oh, people you. really check it out. And you're a fashion shooter, just mm -hmm. like me. Now, for people who want to get into fashion photography, now, if you can give them a quick tip, what would be your killer tip to get into fashion photography? Okay, it's a really quick tip, part A and B. Um, the first part is to make yourself known to the right people, uh, because fundamentally breaking in is about who you know, and that doesn't mean necessarily who you're related to or if you have money. It's, it's does that editor know your work? How do you find your way into there? So that might be social media, it might be Twitter, or it might be going to the right events or the right parties or whatever it may be, calling that person up. So it's really about finding who your target audience is and realizing a business is not an entity, it's made up of people. So when you find the right people, that's how you break in. And then my second tip, kind of tied into that, is to building a really, really good creative team because that creative team is what helps you move to that next level of quality of work so that you're not trying to do the hair and makeup and wardrobe yourself, but surrounding yourself with people that are knowledgeable that help you figure out how to take your images to the next level. And you agree with me that, and I had a lot of discussions with this about with photographers. They always say, you have to advertise, you have to do this. And I always say, you know, the new advertising, it's Google+, Plus, it's Facebook, that's where... And then they say, no, no, that's where the amateurs are. And in my opinion, nowadays, you first have to get out there, make a name for yourself, use social media. And to be totally honest, my telephone hardly ever rings unless my mother calls me. When I get a job, it's all by email, via Absolutely. Twitter, Facebook, because all the celebrities we shoot, mm -hmm. they have Facebook pages, they have Twitter pages, and they see my stuff coming by. They join me first as a friend, and I can see, hey, somebody's joining me as a friend. Oh, my, that's him or him. And then a few weeks later, their management will call me, Frank, we love the stuff you do online. Can you do a shoot with, let's say, one of the celebrities? Mm -hmm. And for me, social media really changed a lot. And I, I hardly ever advertise anymore. I just use the internet. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, everything that I do is about building my reputation online, finding ways to connect with people online. And then it's also knowing, okay, once you connect online, what's the next step to make it a real connection? Maybe it is getting that meeting face to face. You know that seals the deal or or it is that phone call but um, everything initially really is social media and I, I think it's important so if somebody hears your name and they check you out what is available online what kind of reputation do you have personality you said google plus facebook twitter um and also making it easy to connect with you and, and be approachable you know, very approachable what so, i always say exactly. is first aim for the millions and then when you have that one person make it real personal Absolutely. because that's the network and somebody I always say you can be a great shooter, but if you're an asshole, nobody will hire you. <laughs> but if you're so a sure. really nice person and you're an okay shooter, you have much more chance of getting in there. Well, and even let's let's step back from even nice person. It's just easy to work with because with these people, whether it's art directors or whatever it may be, they have a million people that would like to work with them. But what tends to happen is they find somebody that produces work that's acceptable and it's easy to get along with. They don't want to go to the hassle of trying someone else who might be difficult to work with or who can't produce. So that's why it tends to be difficult a lot of times to break in is if that art director finds somebody that can do the job, that's comfort, and they don't have to worry about maybe something going wrong or having to do it again. So it's really, it's finding the way to get your foot in the door. It's not about what's your big break, but it's when you can get your foot in the door with that person to give them, let them give you a chance, then it's about showing your personality and the quality of work. It's, you know, just breaking in is that that challenge. Cool. Thank you so very much, Lindsay. And again, check out her class on kelbytraining.com. Welcome to uh, the door office always open. What's it is always my, open. <laughs> yeah, it's always open. Now, we met in Nieuwegein and you inspired me. And you know, the problem with me was I never liked compositing. And then I, I, saw, you, I, I, saw, I saw you working on the laptop and I was like, 
hmm, if it's that easy, I'm going to do it. And it Photoshop world, you know, it's all about being inspired, uh, getting all pumped up to do your own stuff again. And so I thought, you know what, for this episode, I'm going to ask all my friends like a killer tip that will get them pumped up and excited to go to their computer and start out. Okay. And of course, you're the guy, Lightroom, Photoshop. So I really want to have a killer tip from you. And I think you have something there, right? I, I do, I do, I do. So, and I gotta say, it's funny because you said, uh, you saw me never like compositing. I, when I saw, I never liked guys named Frank. And it's so weird. <laughs> <I'm> just teasing. <laughs> no, you can do that, no problem. He's a good guy. We, we love Frank. <laughs> All right, so, uh, hey, so will anybody watch this? No, uh, Waka, Wagma, Wagma, how do you say it? Oh no, we won't tell the spoon story. Don't worry about it. But what about the, the place? The Wagamama place. Wagamama. Oh, yeah. Did they, 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 did they know Wagamama? Did our viewers? Well, they're worldwide. So, okay. the, so the anybody that in lives Amsterdam. in Amsterdam. Yeah, Wagamama. they will know yummy, Wagamama. Yummy, 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 yummy. All right, that's not the tip. How it is a, a cool big tip, spoon in Wagamama. Yeah, eat from the spoon. All right, so, uh, okay. so when you saw me, um, I was teaching a compositing class. And so you're always, you're always photographing somebody over, hopefully, a contrasty background. Because you want to make a good cutout selection of the person yes so tip you're gonna make a selection and 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 hopefully you've seen a tutorial on how to make those selections because that, that's a whole tutorial in of itself i'll tell you the one thing everybody misses it's this like little hidden feature in photoshop when you make the selection around the person and you cut them out of the layer and you put them onto a different background go to the layer with the person on it if you go under the layer menu all the way down at the bottom is something called matting. And under there, there's something called defringe. Defringe by one pixel, and it helps take that, you know that little fringe that always hangs out no matter how good of a selection you make. There's always one little fringe that hangs out around the edge, and it takes it right off. And you don't have to painstakingly do it with an eraser or anything like that. So, But it's just, it's one of those, it's been around in Photoshop forever, which kind of means it never gets talked about anymore because it's not new. But it helps out a ton. I believe it's also in your book, right? Correct. It's the book Compositing Secrets by Matt Klaskowski, right? Photoshop Compositing Secrets, yep. You sent me the book and I, I, I went through it and you know, I don't have a lot of time to read books. You, you have the same thing. We have busy schedules. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was like, it was so easy to read. And it's one of those books that you can just browse for a few pages and it's not like going on like information, information. No, it's yeah. like information, information, information. Now you got it. Next tip. Yeah. And so, I broke it up in like 15 projects. I figured you jump into the one yeah. you want. And it's so. that I wanted to make a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra advertising <laughs> for because I really love that book. So if you're in compositing, compositing secrets by Matt Laskowski, you can buy it online at Kelby Training. You can buy two online, or yeah. three, or four. The or more six. you buy, the more you buy online, the better it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, and you definitely. Have a lot of any, classes, you can find course. it anywhere. You can, yeah. you know, probably the best place. Yeah, uh, mattk.com, m-a-t-t-k.com, my website. Or like from Killer Tips. Yeah. But okay. uh, it's got my books on there and uh, it's, you know, social media links, all that stuff, so you can find out all about it. Cool. And of course, KelbyTraining.com uh, for all your classes. classes yeah. I love to watch these classes. So. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Matt, Thanks, for this tip. All right. Okay. And see you around. Take care. So, Eddie, we're at Photoshop World and you're teaching several classes here, right? Yes. Okay, now for this episode of The Door of Is Always Open, we're going to do a one-minute tip. And you can take a little bit longer, but... If you would give a tip to, let's say, a starter photographer or an intermediate photographer, what is your killer tip? Mm, my killer tip would be to become kind of study light, study the quality of light, because the three components that really create a, a fabulous image are light, composition, and exposure. But light is the most exciting. Light creates shape, it creates the mood, it can create the entire event of the image. You can change the light on a subject and have a totally different image. Yes. So studying light and becoming uh, familiar with it, or if I can, becoming intimate with light, is a life-changing experience. It doesn't happen overnight. So once you start to learn to see the light, Technically, that's a, a wonderful thing, but when you start to feel the light when you're shooting, that's a whole new experience, and I, I would just recommend study light. Look at light. You know, look through magazines. Look at images. Look at your work. 
look at others work and look at the light study the light that's there because when you start to see the light you start to understand why that image stands out so much more than that image yes and it's all of course we are painting with light because we are photographers that's right and often it is forgotten indeed so you say study your light look at how the shadows fall look how images are being more three-dimensional and start learning really how to control and of course manipulate your light yes okay I think that's a great tip awesome and you have a lot of classes on Photoshop world right yes this is my busiest one in a few years I haven't had a chance to see your show this time <laughs> oh yeah it's or so anybody busy. else's but uh, but it's a wonderful experience to be here and to have the people walk up to you and say it's a special place. feeling here right yes, it's, it is a wonderful it's amazing feeling. it is indeed and you also have classes on Kelby training I have classes on Kelby training I have classes on Udemy which is a new uh, website it's actually a course on udemy.com slash smart objects I'm teaching a course on utilizing putting a smart object into a workflow it's cool it's kind of advanced not necessarily advanced but it's when you're ready to take the quality of your workflow to the next level in Photoshop smart objects is the way to go so this is a steady course it's uh, interesting and I'm very excited about it it's brand cool. new RC my friend welcome at Photoshop world man what's going on man how are you oh, I'm great Photoshop world it's for me it's like next to Christmas, the best thing ever. It's 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 a wonderful place. It's thousands of people getting together, just working with, you know, photography, Photoshop, lighting, all sorts of different things. So it's definitely one of our favorite things too. And it's always a, it's always really good to have you come over, of man. Of course, man. I only see you like two, three times a year. And I it's know, like, man. I'm gonna see RC again. So, but it's but it's, it's a good time. Really cool. Yeah, it's a good time. So for this episode of the door of is always open, I'm interviewing friends of mine who are teaching at Photoshop World, and you are one of the teachers at Photoshop World, of right, course. Right, right. And what I ask is a one-minute tip, and of course you can take two minutes. It can be about anything: photography, design, whatever you like. Okay. So what would you say to our viewers that can help them progress in their Photoshop Lightroom or, of course, photography? One of the things that I think that that is absolutely essential when working with trying to get your photography better is to make sure that you take advantage of your technology to take advantage of your opportunity. A lot of the times what happens is we get very involved in wanting technology. We want iPads, yeah. we want tablets, we want cameras, we want this. But we tend to consume them and we don't tend to use them a lot for the production of work. So like for example, I tell people all the time, I carry a tablet all the time. I don't carry it to consume but one of the reasons that I carry it is to be able to show very, very quickly my work. I do a lot of HDR photography, which means that I have to have people stand for long periods of time doing multiple exposures. That's very hard to communicate to somebody that's never seen it or has never done any of that type of work. So if you're trying to get to a new location where you want to do, you know, get access and do any of that stuff, you don't want to sit there and talk to a guard of a beautiful tower and say, no, of course. I kind of want to do this and it's going to be multiple pictures and I'm going to put it together. And then, so instead of doing all of that, what I would recommend is you carry it with you and you go, I would like to be able to make a picture for you with this. And then they see it. The yeah. moment that they see it, they can connect with it and you'll be surprised as to how many times those no's can be turned into yeses. And that's the name of the game when you're working with photography or anything. It's you want to make sure that you can get these people on your side as fast as possible and something as little as using technology to be able to do that is a great way for you to do that. That's a great tip. So always carry stuff like your iPad with a portfolio mm -hmm. or, your info, or your Android or whatever device. You know, okay, well, here's another thing that I do very, very quickly. There's a company in, uh, I think it's in the UK, called Moo, right? And Moo produces these business cards. And I think that there's companies out there that do that. But you have one picture per business card. You can do multiple packs. So I have 50 cards, all have 50 different pictures. That's so cool. now I can go to a person and they say, if you want a business card, automatically I fan them out and I go, you pick one. That's cool, and they will pick their favorite one and keep you it. You know a style because of the one that they picked, and they get to see your portfolio at that one spot. It's all about opportunity. Maximizing that opportunity will get you ahead all the time. That's a very cool tip. 
So I will thank you so very much. And you still have classes on Photoshop World. Yeah, right? I have. Yeah, I have tons of. I've got three more classes that we've got to do today, so we're going to be very, very oh, busy. Oh man, you're busy. It's a great time. It's a great time, though. Okay, have fun and thanks, RC. And uh, I think this was a great tip to get you ahead in photography. Take care, guys. So, see you. Thanks, man. So, Scott. Thank you so very much for being on the episode of The Doorhof is Always Open, like what's in the name. <laughs> My pleasure. Now what I want to do is, man, you've been interviewed so many times and I don't want to talk to you about, okay, Scott, what do you think will be gone in Photoshop CS7? <laughs> Thank, I, you. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, because we're going to repeat it over and over. Now, many of the instructors, and I, I agree with you, you said it on stage, Photoshop world is at the best instructors in the world. And I always tell people when I go on KelbyTraining.com, I get inspired because there are so many great people there. So I don't want to repeat this stuff. What I want to do is I want to pick your brain, how you are as a person. Now, when I fly, and you fly a lot more than me, I find that when I watch a movie at home, I can watch for two hours, two and a half hours straight. But when I'm in a plane, somehow my brain shuts down at 45 minutes. So I have a lot of documentaries on there and they're 45 minutes and I get bored. I want to do something else and it's weird because I'm in a plane for 11 hours. What I found out is that when I put like Married with Children on my iPad, <laughs> I can watch for six hours straight because it's 22 minutes, 22 minutes. Now I wonder what do you have on your iPod or, or iPad, sorry, or what do you do in the plane to, to get from boring? So I love movies. So I go to the iTunes store, I rent movies before every flight. So I, I download them the night before, and uh, I can watch a movie all the way through, no problem. So it's, it's I, I, as long as it's like a romantic comedy or an action movie or something like that, I can watch movies. Every once in a while, if it gets boring, I'll fall asleep watching the movie. But otherwise, I love to watch movies. I also like to download magazines. I download a number of the UK-based magazines, and, uh, and I love to read them uh, on, on my iPad as well. I also pray, play uh, Temple Run. Oh no, I that know. was so. My, my son downloaded it and I found it on my iPad. And at first I was a little bit upset because we say to him, You can't download games. And I was flying and I saw Temple. What's Temple Run? And I started playing it. And before I know it, we have reached Washington DC. I was on land. And I'm like, Oh wow, Angry Birds is addictive, but that's even worse. And my daughter was the one that put that on my. Oh, so you have the same experience. Oh, so uh, yeah, and, and I love it. I, I can play. I even got the the one that Disney did for the movie Brave, and I've taken that game as far as I can go. So right now I'm on a hiatus from playing uh, from playing games, but I will. I'll play games. I read magazines, but all photography magazines. Uh, I don't really download any other kind. No, that's the same for me. I love photography. It's your passion. Sure. Now talking about passion, this this goes really nice, like a bridge. Oh, sorry, no bridge. Uh, like a light room to the next question, right? Um, when you are you're a very busy man, and like me, you have a passion for your work. But you also have a wonderful wife, Calibra, and I you do. have kids. I do. I have wonderful kids. Now, for me, uh, I started out working out like two years ago for the simple reason I found out that I get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and Annemiek was standing in the studio, tapping her feet at 11 o'clock at night. Frank, I was like, it's only 6. No, it's 11. I'm going to bed. And I was like, uh-oh. Time goes like that. Yeah, and I found out that when I work out, and I always do it before we have dinner. So at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, um, I go work out for 45 minutes, do a real cardio workout, then have my dinner. And to be honest, I'm then like, I don't want to go to work anymore. And we start watching a movie. How do you manage, because you're way more busy than me, how do you manage to keep and your company together and your family. How do you divide between those two? So I, I think there must be a perception that I'm busier than I really am. Now that's I, cool. Yeah, I, I because I don't I don't feel like I'm that that crazy busy. We we have 85 employees, and so I have two full time assistants. So I have a photo assistant that's full time, and I have an executive assistant that's full time, and so they allow me to be able to do so much. For example, so if I want to do a shoot tomorrow, Frank, I just you know, pick up the phone right across the hall from me is Brad. And I go, hey, Brad, we're going to do a shoot tomorrow. I, I need a male and a female model. Uh, I'm going to need a 53-inch Octa. I'm going to need uh, two lights in the back with grids. I give them the whole specs. When I walk in the next day, the studio's lit. Everything's set up. My laptop's there. The tether cables run. 
the settings are all ready, everything's been checked, I can just walk in and do the shoot. And so I can bang out a shoot in a really short amount of time. When I leave there, I can go to the next set over and I can shoot a show. When I walk in the door, everything's lit, everything's done. And that's the, the benefit of having all these people, is that, that you, you can do what, you can do so much in one day because if I had to do it on my own or just with one other person helping me, I'd never get this stuff done. Uh, so it allows me to do what looks like a tremendous amount in one day. If you're thinking, man, I could never do that all, but I'm not doing it all. I have a lot of help, and that help makes a huge difference. Okay. So that's that's the, you know, people ask me, what's the secret? And you're doing all the stuff, and like, it's, I can do a lot in one day, and then I can take the next day off. <laughs> you know what, I take, people think that I'm, I'm like going crazy all the time. I, I think I take eight to nine weeks off a year. And when I take those weeks off, Frank, I'm really off. I'm I know not working. You I'm not, and and I'll have the guys at the, at the office cover my blog for me. You know, they'll you'll see. Hey, it's RC with a guest post. You know, oh, so I must be on vacation. I know you once texted me from Amsterdam. Hey, Frank, I'm in Amsterdam. Don't tell anybody, but I'm going away. <laughs> yeah, because that was so funny. Well, also when I travel, um, you know, I don't, I don't always tell people if if it's a business trip, like I have to do a seminar, and I need people to come to the seminar, then I announce it. But for my own private travel with my family. I don't really tell everybody, hey, we're gone, the house is empty, help yourself. <laughs> kinda, that's a good one. That's so, a real good tip. <laughs> so I don't ever, so that's why all of a sudden my blog reads, I'm back from 10 days in Italy. You know, it's because I don't announce it till I get back. That's a good one. I have two more questions for you, sure, very of course. quick. A lot of people will think about Scott Kelby like he can do anything he wants because he's Scott Kelby. Now, what I found very interesting was the story you wanted to shoot sports. Mm -hmm. And you were really trying to get into the sports and then you took a job and actually that cracked me up because i think it's one of the luxiest pays oh it's there is working no for the wire and yeah. just to get that passion and i think for our viewers a lot of people will stop if something doesn't work they want to they don't want to go that extra mile like what you did go and work for a wire to to get a job what's your opinion about that if you want something really bad well you know it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I talked when I was in uh, London doing a seminar. A gentleman waited in line to talk to me at the end of the seminar, and he came up and he said, "He said, um, Mr. Kelby, I, I'm I really love landscape photography, and I, I've heard you talk that to really get good landscape shots, you you have to be up before dawn, be in place, or you have to shoot at sunset." And he goes, yeah, "It sounds like a lot of work. Is there another way I can do it where I don't have to be up at dawn?" I'm like, "No." No, that's kind of what you have to do. And he's like, well, what if I'm just practicing and it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon? I'm like, look, if you want to get, get great landscape shots, you have to do two things. You have to travel to a great location. You can't just say, I'm going to shoot you know, half an hour from my house. If it's not a great landscape location, you have to travel to where a great landscape location is. And... You know, you may not get to do it every week. You may have to wait till like, okay, next next year for my vacation, I'm going to go to Arizona. I'm going to go to the Grand Canyon. I'm going to go to the south of France. I'm going to go to the Alps. I'm going to go someplace amazing, and I'm going to focus on getting a great shot there. But the second thing is you have to be willing to do what it takes. You have to be willing to be up at 4 in the morning in the freezing cold, and you're taking a chance because it may be a fabulous morning with beautiful light, or it may just be a morning. It could be gray. The sun comes up. There's not a cloud in the sky. There's no, it, you know what I mean? It can be, but but that's what's required to get the kind of shots that that guy really wants. He he wants fantastic landscape shots, but he's not willing to do the very basics of what you do to get. Now, of course, you have to learn the camera technique real easy. I mean, well, but honestly, that's the easiest part of it. Learning to set your camera at f22 and use oh, a yeah. tripod is not the hardest thing in the world. No. But the people that get great landscape shots go to great landscapes, and, they're, and they put themselves in a position to be there when something magical happens. Yeah, not the Kodak moment, just, or I mean the uh, postcard moment, right. but something unique, like Moose. Oh yeah. Ooh. He will be there at 3 a.m. if he knows it will be great. Oh, sure. And you know what, Moose, but here's the thing that's great about Moose. Moose will get there at 3 a.m. and knowing that it might not be. But he still he still does it. Moose is one of those guys that's the most willing. Moose is the kind of guy that will stand in a swamp in the freezing cold waiting for birds to take off. And he knows that they may take off in the other direction. 
he he they, he never may never get a single shot, but that's the kind of passion it takes. You really to get the kind of stuff you want, you have to work for it. If it was easy, everybody would have fabulous landscape shots. Everybody would have fashion, fabulous fashion shots. If it was easy, you have to be willing to learn the techniques and to do what it takes and to build sets like you do and do all the things that you do to create something special. It doesn't just happen because you pull out a camera. It's like so it's 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 just an interesting thing. I hear so many people who you know, just like I wanted to shoot sports, I wanted I had to sign on with a wire service. I had to go to my wife and go, "Honey, taking another job <laughs> which is <laughs> that was hilarious didn't yeah. go over as well as I thought no actually she was tremendously supportive she know she knew that I've been struggling for years and every once in a while you'd get an opportunity to shoot a game here or there but you know what it's like anything else Frank you can't shoot three games a year and ever get good at it no no you have to practice you have to practice and practice for, for four months I get to shoot every single weekend and a lot of times it requires me to travel but I'm really careful about staying uh, away from home for a long time so if I shoot a game, I will take a 5 a.m. flight, go, shoot the 1 o'clock game, drive straight to the airport and fly home. So I'm home. So I, I get home that very same night. And, and it's, it requires a lot of flying. Yeah. <laughs> and, I'm getting used to it now. But yeah. But, but I, I, I'm happy to say that most of, of, of my, my travel is with my family and uh, is, uh, is for vacation. So because... Most like in the U.S., I'm doing short little hops from here to Atlanta, from here to New York, from here to Dallas. But my fun trips are from here to Amsterdam, from here to London, from here to Paris, from here to Istanbul. So I get I get to do a lot of travel. My wife is a travel fanatic, uh, and we stop buying each other gifts. I I've got camera gear, <laughs> I've got lights. Yeah. Now we buy each other trips. So she just bought me a, a trip to to Paris because I did a workshop there. I work the whole time. Yeah, you're going to do the photo walk in Paris. I am doing my I'm photo walk I'm going to do it in Paris. Amsterdam. Why didn't you tell me before? Then I would have joined you in Paris. It was my wife's idea. Yeah. She said, honey, we're going to be in Paris. Do you want to stay an extra day and do your photo walk? I'm like, yes, I do. Well, <laughs> I'll be thinking about you guys. Now, again, you have been asked so many questions. Is there one question that you're afraid of that you will get ever asked in an interview? Is there a question that I'm afraid that I will never get asked in an no, interview? No, that you will get asked That I will get asked in an interview? Hmm. Man, is that a tricky question? I don't know. Well, I guess it would be... The, the, the worst question you could ask me is, what is your actual weight? That, no, I don't think <laughs> that, I would not like anyone no, to no, ask no. that. Because, you know... It's, yeah, but it's a I lot think, of smoke and mirrors. I think we'll do premiere for both of us. <laughs> okay, then the final question for you. Now, you are, like me now, surrounded by some of, in my opinion, the best photographers in the world. You have Dave Black, you have Moose Peterson, Joe McNally. Where do you get your inspiration from? Those are the guys I get my inspiration from. You know, uh, I've been very lucky because I work with them to be able to, to call them. And, and, and these are guys that want to help, right? So when I shot my going to shoot my first ice hockey game, I guess there's no other kind of hockey, ice hockey, just hockey. Uh, I knew Dave Black had shot it. I called Dave Black and said, "Dave, I'm going to shoot my first hockey game." And he goes, "Here's what you got to do." And he gave me this whole list of things. And you know what? Uh, you know, people have asked me a question. I get asked is, you know, what's the secret of your success? You know, what the secret of my success is I take other people's advice. If I call Dave Black and he says, "Do this and this and this and this," I follow it exactly. I don't go, I don't know about number four, you know. If, if I, I really do generally take advice. My wife gives unbelievable advice. Oh, but she's I mean, a great photographer when you see her iPhone shots. Wow. Oh, I know. But she's also a great, she's got a great head for business and uh, just a great, She she's a great read of people. She So uh, I, I, I trust her advice implicitly. If she says, this is how it's going to go down and this is what you should do, I'm like, okay, you know. And so when I call Joe McNally and say, hey, Joe, can you tell me this thing about Flash? If he says to do it, I go, okay, I'm going to do it. And I just follow it. Dave Black with hockey, I followed every single thing he said. And, of course, he was right. Everything you do, he's like, wow, of course. But I run into so many people who will ask for advice, but they're just hoping to hear what they want. They're hoping you hear what, what, what they think is already in their mind. They just want to hear you go, yes, what you were thinking is correct. And, um, and that's not normally the case. So, um, you know, I, I called Dave, I called Joe, 
Uh, I call anybody, you know, I've asked you questions. Um, I, I call, I ask the people I respect, and I'm very, very lucky that they're, that we have a kind of relationship where they will tell me. And I would do the same for them. I, I have lots of people ask me Photoshop questions and different things, and I'm thrilled to tell them because I, I finally get to pay somebody back. Yeah. You know, like if Joe asked me a question about Lightroom or Photoshop, I'm like, yes, I get to <laughs> give them something back because I call these people so much. But that's been a tremendous advantage, right? When you can call the world's best, and I agree with you. I mean, these are the world's best people that, that we're, we're both blessed to be able to work with. And, uh, and they're the most giving people in the world. There's nobody, Frank, that you couldn't call of this group that wouldn't bend over backwards to oh, help yeah, you or something. Oh, no, yeah. I've mailed sometimes with Joe and with, with Moose, and they gave me so many advice. And previous, I would buy the Vogue, you know, because I'm in fashion. Right. So I, I browse through the Vogue and I see all those images. And sometimes I, I also get stuck. Right. And then you just start mailing, like now you have Lindsay Adler, we just talked, and she already pumped me up like, oh, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that, so it's great. And for the people here, go on kelbytraining.com, and I kid you not, if I want to be inspired, I always watch the videos on Kelby Training. And of course, go to Scott's blog, and I'm really honored to have you on Dude, the door. We're, for so we're so honored to have you in the family, are you kidding? <laughs> Thank you so very much, Scott. Absolutely my pleasure. Okay. Uh-huh.